is actually a really interesting and complicated thing. So when we think about dry eye, we think that it's a uh, problems with tears. But we know now that dry eye is so much more than that. So dry eye is both symptoms of dry eye, and symptoms of dry eye can be dryness, burning, aching, it can be blurry vision, it can be tearing, and there's signs of dry eye, like not making enough tears or having the tears evaporate quicker than normal. And the thing about it is that we know that the symptoms of dry eye don't match up with the signs. So that makes it very complicated. And the problem is people use dry eye to mean many different things. But what we do know about dry eye, regardless of how you define it, is that it's common and that it really affects quality of life. And that's why we think it's something really important both to study and to treat. There are lots of things that cause dry eye. We look for systemic conditions like Sjogren's disease. And those types of conditions are generally associated with a problem in tear production. So you don't make as many tears. And then there's other conditions that are associated with having abnormal tear evaporation like for example, rosacea. And there's other conditions that we've studied that we really don't know why they're associated with dry eye, but they come up over and over. Things like depression and anxiety. We know that people who are depressed and anxious have more dry eye symptoms. And we know that both the diagnosis and the medications they're on affect a diagnosis of dry eye. And then there's allergies. You asked me about allergies, and I think that's a really interesting part of dry eye because traditionally we keep those separate. So some people have allergies and some people have dry eye. But we've done some re recent research that shows that the two actually may be combined. So what we did is we looked at dry eye diagnosis in a VA population over the entire US. And what we found is that dry eye was being diagnosed more commonly in the spring. And actually the highest frequency of diagnosis was in April and that really corresponds with allergy season. So what we did is we looked at pollenindex.com and it gives you a pollen index which tells you how high the pollen levels are. And we found that there was a relationship between pollen counts and dry eye. And so this suggests that some patients with dry eye may have a component of allergy. And the reason that's important is because the way we treat allergy is different than the way we traditionally treat dry eye and that maybe we can individualize therapy better if we can figure out what's driving dry eye in an individual patient. The treatment of dry eye really depends on what's driving the dry eye. Artificial tears are a good first line treatment because they're easy, they're over the counter, they soothe the eye, and they help with a lot of different aspects of dry eye. But some people have persistent symptoms even using artificial tears. And then we have to decide what's next. So patients who have inflammation on their ocular surface, and a lot of those patients may also have systemic autoimmune conditions, they tend to do well with topical anti-inflammatories. So we can use corticosteroids, we can use topical cyclosporin, the trade name is Restasis, to treat that subsection of patients with dry eye. Some people have more of an evaporative issue, and the problem really is in the oil glands. And so what we try to do is make the oil glands healthier by using something called lid hygiene, where we clean the oil glands or the area around the oil glands to help them work better, or give medications both orally and topically to help oil gland function. And then there's another subset of dry eye patients, and those are the patients that feel dry, but they're not actually dry. And that's kind of a tough group that we all are acknowledging that we see more often. And what we think is going on is we think that the nerves that connect the cornea to the brain are firing without dryness on the ocular surface. And so really, they can be considered as having more of kind of a neuropathic pain than dryness on their ocular surface. And how to best diagnose and treat those patients is still a matter of controversy, but what we think is if we can make nerves healthier, it would also be a good aspect in addressing dry eye symptoms. Prevention of dry eye is a really interesting topic, and the reason for that is we really don't know how to prevent dry eye. But here are some suggestions. We think that what happens with dry eye is you have abnormalities or environmental stressors on the ocular surface. And over time, those environmental stressors cause the tears and the nerves on the surface to be abnormal. And so what we think is trying to keep your eyes as healthy as possible is maybe a key to trying to help either prevent dry eye 
or treat mild disease. So what are some options? Environment matters. We know that environmental stress, dust, wind, pollution affects the health of the eyes and we've actually published on that. And so what we recommend is to have an idea of what kind of pollutants you come in contact with on an everyday basis. In Miami, mold is an issue and there's some low cost measures that can help you treat mold in the house and not only will that probably help affect eye health but it'll also affect your systemic health. Other things are air pollution and so putting in a high quality air filter in the home may be a good way to try to decrease the air pollution that you're exposed to on a daily basis. Nutrition is another aspect that we talk about in dry eye. We know that omega-3 helps with dry eye. Things like fish oil, flaxseed oil. We know that omega-3 is broken down into these lipid mediators that help resolve inflammation. Anti-inflammatory agents, resolvins and protectins. And so there have been many studies that show that if you take an oral omega-3 formulation every day, the signs and symptoms of dry eye go down. So we think that having a healthy diet rich with omega-3s is another way to help keep the eyes healthy.